you know, actually one of the top, at least in my opinion, one of the top five supplements that all athletes should take. It is on beta alanine. So uh, take it away, Dr. Stout. Thanks. Thanks, Joey. Um, there's a little more story, a little more to that story at Delaware, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, so today uh, I've been asked to present on beta alanine in uh, 25 minutes. And beta alanine doesn't have as much, uh, you know, research as creatine does, but it still has a lot. So this is going to be uh, fun. Um, I will want, I do want to disclose that over the last 10 years, I have received funding uh, to investigate the effects of beta alanine. So let's get started. So what I want to do is briefly talk about fatigue from a metabolic standpoint. And um, there are different kinds of fatigue, but anybody who's been an athlete in a sport that's been associated with extreme fatigue knows what I'm talking about here. So, you know, how you manage that feeling of fatigue or um, either through nutrition or mental toughness can be the difference between winning and losing. Not to mention it really puts some interesting facial expressions on, you know, uh, on athlete's face, uh, as you can see here, um, uh, when somebody's extremely fatigued. You know, one of the things about uh, being able to delay fatigue, regardless of what kind of fatigue it is, is that you will see obviously an improvement in performance, improvement in exercise capacity, and it, it can also augment the effects of training uh, through greater intensity or training volume. So <clears throat> one of the things I'm gonna talk about today is more of the you know, peripheral fatigue, not the central fatigue. And there are different theories behind why we fatigue and um, everything from substrate depletion, and that's like your creatine phosphate, your glycogen, in some rare cases, maybe ATP, um, or met metabolite accumulation, um, as you can see here, today is what we're going to be focused on, and that is the buildup of hydrogen ions. When we increase the acidity within a muscle cell, it causes all kinds of problems if the pH is low enough. So it, it can cause uh, issues with the generation of energy or the breakdown of ATP, uh, calcium um, release and uptake, which will disrupt muscle contraction and eventually will lead to fatigue. But these are important factors to understand in order to understand the benefit of beta alanine. So some of the exercises associated with producing high hydrogen uh, ion levels and resulting fatigue is actually resistance exercise, particularly the high volume type of exercise repeated sprint or repeated maximum muscle contractions with minimal rest. And some examples could be like soccer, basketball, boxing, rowing, judo, cycling, et cetera. There's a lot of sports where there's uh, intermittent high intensity work um, usually results in high hydrogen ion pr production. And even at our uh, anaerobic threshold, um, when you're running, depending how good a shape you're in, could be anywhere from 65 to 85% of your VO2 max, we can also see a greater production of hydrogen ions. So, you know, uh, hydrogen ion is the monster we want to defeat with um, various nutritional products. And today we're going to talk about beta alanine. Um, many of the supplements um, that you see that actually can improve acute performance um, through, through the buffering, it, it can do this through the buffering uh, or delay of the buildup of hydrogen ions. For example, phosphocreatine, uh, sodium bicarb, and in our case, carnosine or beta alanine. And when you can do that, um, another uh, phrase for that in the literature is mus muscle buffering capacity. So the more you're able to buffer those metabolites, in this, in this case, hydrogen ions, the greater the muscle buffering capacity that you will have. So muscle buffering capacity is the ability to buffer, regulate hydrogen ion accumulation during high intensity exercise. And there are basically two lines of defense. The first line of defense is our intracellular biocarbonate buffering system. So this is bicarbonate, there's certain amino acids, inorganic phosphates, and also creatine phosphate. Um, and then we have our intracellular non-bicarbonate 
uh, buffering system, and this is carnosine. And some scientists, primarily the person who started all of this, Roger Harris, suggested that carnosine may buffer hydrogen ions at a higher rate uh, during intense exercise compared to bicarbonate system. The second line of defense is actually exporting those hydrogen ions out of the cell. So when we do high intensity interval training, you see an increased ability of our body to export hydrogen ions outside the cell as an adaptation. The other one is extracellular bicarbonate buffering system. This is where sodium bicarb supplementation can also assist in delaying fatigue by you know, um, taking care of those hydrogen ions. Now, when you look at certain sports and its relationship to um, muscle buffering capacity, you can see that the higher the muscle buffering capacity an athlete has, the greater total work they're able to do. So in this case, you see team sport athletes, and a lot of these sports are repeated or in intermittent high intensity bouts of exercise or, or movement. And then the endurance train, the cycling, rowing, and triathlons, while they're still um, majority or higher than the untrained individuals, then they're not far off from the repeated uh, sport performance. But you can see that the team sports seem to uh, reflect a higher muscle buffering capacity. Also, when you look at muscle buffering capacity and its relationship with muscle currency levels, they go hand in hand. So in this study where they looked at an anaerobic speed test, you can see that the athletes that had the higher muscle buffering capacity also had the higher muscle carnosine levels and reflected their ability on the anaerobic speed test. So in this case, they looked at sprinters, rowers, marathoners, and then the untrained. So increasing our muscle buffering capacity or our muscle carnosine concentration has been shown to improve short and long sprint performance, repeated sprint performance, total training volume, time to exhaustion, peak power output, and some anaerobic threshold measures. So first of all, how does, where do we get carnosine from? And in our diet, we get it from only meat, doesn't come in vegetables. So, um, you know, carnosine naturally is in meats such as fish, turkey, chicken breast, and so on. So we must consume animal-based protein in order to get this nutrient in our diet. Now, when we consume carnosine, it actually is broken down. Carnosine is a dipeptide. So it's broken down into um, the histidine and beta alanine um, where it's rapidly hydrolyzed by an enzyme called carnosine ACE, which is interesting because it's, this enzyme is only in humans. So the difference between animal and humans is in animals, you can give carnosine and it doesn't get broken down and there's different metabolic and potential effects in animal studies that you don't see in humans. And beta alanine and histidine then are transported to skeletal muscle where it's taken up and then resynthesized into carnitine. And it's believed or suggested that the beta alanine is the rate limiting substrate for carnitine synthesis. It's not L histidine. And you don't need L histidine in your supplementation because intramuscular levels of L histidine are very high. Whereas beta alanine is very low. So if you only, you only need to supplement beta alanine in order to trigger the synthesis of carnosine. Now, when you look at different athletes or different populations, um, sort of diet or training history, you can see that they, different, they have different levels of carnosine within um, skeletal muscle. You see where the bodybuilders and Olympic speed skaters, um, you know, uh, physically active sports science students, then elderly, and you can see vegetarians are the lowest. And vegetarians are the lowest because they don't eat meat. Um, but you can still see they have some, and it is possible for the body to endogenously create it through the ear cell and the liver. It's another metabolic process, very inefficient. Um, so that's why the levels are pretty low. 
Now I'll talk about supplement strategy. I just want to make sure we're not confusing this with creatine. You know, we, we know and we can attain muscle saturation with creatine after five days of loading. Um, also, the response is much higher um, in those with the lowest levels of creatine. Now, beta-alanine uh, supplementation protocols to date have not come close to reaching carnosine saturation point in the muscle. Unlike creatine, beta-alanine supplementation's ability to increase carnosine is not influenced by value, um, baseline values or gender. And also, there's a 99.3% response rate to beta-alanine supplementation that leads to an increase in muscle carnosine levels. Now, does that mean it leads to ergogenic benefit? Not always. But we do know there is a high uh, response rate to muscle uh, carnosine levels. You know, the proven supplementation protocol, I mean, the majority of the data suggests that 6.4 grams per day for four weeks or a total of about 180 grams seems to be the most effective dose for ergogenic effect. There are studies that show two weeks or four weeks of 3.2 grams, um, but those are not as consistent as the 6.4 grams per day. So 80, 180 grams total of beta alanine may be a minimal do dose um, you, know, you need in order to observe an ergogenic effect. Now it has been recently postulated that you know, consuming between 1,200 or 1,500 grams total would significantly increase muscle carnosine closer to the saturation point. So if we really wanted to see how long that would take, I went ahead and calculated that out. In order to take 6.4 grams a day for, you know, that 1.6 grams four times a day, you're talking, you know, 188 to 234 days before we theoretically reach our saturation point. So if this is true, then there may be greater ergogenic effects that have not been reported. And there could be ergogenic effects in other types of performances and not just the ones we've identified so far. But until that is researched, um, it's just hypothesis right now. You know, one of the top scientists in the world, uh, Dr. Craig Sale, made an interesting statement and basically was saying it's not about, you know, how much you take per, you know, per unit or per dose. It's a total amount of beta alanine that you take that influences the concentration of carnosine in the muscle. And so a lot of people get hung up on I take 800 milligrams, I take 1200 milligrams, 1600 milligrams at a time when I exercise or when I train or through the entire month. It's really not about that, it's about the total accumulation. So um, there is a couple of studies that looked at, um, you know, what is the maintenance dose? So once you've elevated your carnosine levels in the muscle, what is the optimal um, sort of dose. And we know that when you stop uh, consuming beta alanine, you have this like decay of about 2% per week. So it's very little. So it lasts in your system for a long time. Well, the, it seems that 1.2 grams per day will do the trick um, to maintain. However, the potential to increase muscle carnosine exists with greater total beta alanine supplementation so my question is, why stop the loading phase? It's, remember, it's not like creatine where we know we reach our, our saturation point, you know, within five or six days. So um, why not continue this until you've done this for 200 days, you know? So what are some of the, you know, benefits of increasing muscle carnosine levels? Well, there's a, a nice study um, published back in 2012 by Hobson that kind of did this meta-analysis and looking that the majority of the science shows that, you know, the duration of 60 to 240 seconds, any kind of high-intensity event seems to benefit, 
you know, from increasing muscle carnosine levels. And the type of exercise is actually the total capacity. So your ability to maintain a repeated sprint intensity. This is why you may see an improvement in something like soccer or hockey, um, because you have that ability to maintain your speed doesn't drop off. We published um, a review of a paper, a book chapter um, a couple of years ago, where we broke this down even more. And if you look on here, we're, you know, this is like zero to 60 uh, seconds. And um, you can see that the majority of the data is either maybe or no for that type of performance, um, that, that uh, intensity for a set amount of time. There's only a few articles. In agreement um, with the previous meta-analysis, the majority of the performance increase is during that, you know, 60 to 200, 204, 240 second range, where we see the majority of the performances are increased. There's one that's maybe, and there's one that's a no. But what was really interesting and pretty much goes against some other folks is the ability to increase performance between that four minutes all the way up to 25 minutes. Now, the data is not as strong as the 60 to 240 or 204, but it's still, you know, there's a possibility. We see a number of studies um, that have shown an ergogenic benefit and a few studies that have shown no ergogenic benefit. So what's interesting is I drew this uh, yellow sort of band around um, the area of time in which carnosine may have a benefit effect. And you can see all the different sports, you know, combat sports and wrestling, I'm not sure why they're separated, um, but you can see where, um, you know, it's worth, it's worth trying if you're working with an athlete that may play one of these sports. So the question is, should you have your athlete supplement beta alanine? So is there a chance that it will hurt from a medical standpoint or performance standpoint? Well, with the exception of the paresthesia, there's been no reported side effects um, and no data suggests an ergolytic effect. Maybe no effect, but not doesn't hurt your performance. The no adverse effect, the one adverse effect that most people were concerned with was a decrease in taurine levels in the muscle. But studies from our lab and also from, you know, uh, studies in Brazil and studies in Europe show that this is not happening. This is not a significant um, effect or concern. Now in animals, it did show a decrease in taurine levels. Now, is there a chance it may help? Well, maybe uh, for performances lasting from zero to 60 seconds. Remember, we had, it was sort of a mix, sort of, uh, uh, sort of combination, and probably leaning more towards no, but there's always that possibility that it may help. And yes, I, you know, for most sort of performances or training sets between 60 to 240 seconds. And then a strong maybe for performances between four and 25 minutes. Is it uh, on any band list? And the answer is no. So I think that if I had an athlete that competed in an event, like for instance, a lot of combat sports are around four minutes and, um, um, or, you know, between the 60 and 240, definitely all the combat athletes I've, I've had, you know, try that. Um, because I know it's not gonna hurt, you know, as long as they're used to the paresthesia, a little tingling, um, which most of them like, uh, it's not a problem. So I want to get done early so I can have plenty of time to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Stout. Hey, I actually have a question because people have asked me this about uh, getting a beta alanine supplement that doesn't cause paresthesia. Well, um, 
I wish I could say that there is a supplement out there that doesn't, but there are some that um, that uh, attenuate the amount of paresthesia that you get, and that is the sort of sustained release form. And what uh, is there a brand here? I'm gonna. Um, well, if they have the Carno Sin sort of uh, trademark on it that that company's using, it's usually the you know sustained release. So the Carnison brand, okay. So the sustained release, because um, that's I think that's uh, that seems to be the biggest um, complaint about it. Also, the initial dosing. A lot of people, a lot of people who have tried it have said, well, the initial. I mean, roughly was it six to seven grams a day, six grams a day. Um, they don't like dividing it into multiple doses. So that's problem number one with, I guess with the, um, uh, the carnison that's sustained release, that's, that solves that a little bit. But let's say you skip that high dose initially, like with creatine, if you just do three grams a day forever, I think you're fine. Could you do just a low dose forever and be fine? Remember, it's all about total, total amount. So wait, okay, then, because someone asked me, because they're like, well, what if I just took one gram a day? Would, is that okay? Not a, well, <laughs> initially, yes, but when you get to a certain level, I think you have to take a little bit more. That's what that one study shows, 1.2 grams in order to maintain what you have. Okay. So I think if you were to consume 1.6 grams or even better, 3.2 grams, which is two doses a day, right? 1.6 grams each in the morning and night that eventually over a period of time would reach. And remember, we got to reach that 180 gram sort of threshold. Right, right. And so whenever you reach that, in theory, that's potentially when you'd see an ergogenic effect. It's not, unfortunately, it's not as quick as creatine. Um, and that's one of the major issues with, obviously with beta alanine. That it's not as compared to yeah. creatine. Yeah, it takes weeks. It, it takes weeks, not days, in order to okay, this, one, this was a question actually asked of me as it relates to uh, brain function. This was, I was talking to some neuro people. Um, the data on beta alanine affecting cognitive performance. Um, I know there's a little out there, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, we've done a few studies on that. And we actually did an MRI study. We don't think it was powerful. Uh, the magnet was powerful enough to really detect changes in the brain, but it was in uh, elite um, soldiers. Um, uh, they took beta alanine. We were able to detect a significant increase in skeletal muscle, but there was no change in brain. That, that's still uh, a hypothesis that's uh, um, being proven. Uh, I'm a little bit skeptical of that, to be quite honest. Um, but, but I think you do see cognitive benefit um, as with anything that delays fatigue, because sometimes uh, the feeling that we have, uh, the pain that we may have in our peripheral system may affect our ability to think. Um, yeah, right. so, so when you de are delaying fatigue or delaying that, that sort of pain, your focus is better. So in those studies, we actually showed improved cognitive, you know, scores where they're able to count and then their ability to um, uh, shoot was still uh, maintained at a higher level than compared to the group that didn't take beta alanine and were fatiguing faster. So I think um, anytime you can delay that sense of fatigue or that pain associated with it, uh, you have much better focus. All right, a couple other great questions here. Um, I'm going to ask two of them. One is, are there any health-related benefits to beta alanine? Because I know with creatine, we have plenty of health-related benefits. And two, would you adjust the dosage for a vegan or vegetarian athlete? No, I keep it the same. For them, it's the same way. Remember, it's not, it's not about their baseline values. Um, everybody benefits uh, regardless of your baseline values, unlike creatine. So um, I would have them do the same exact sort of dosing until they get that 180. And 